Good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us tonight, and thanks for supporting the Land Trust. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to provide an overview of our current projects and what we're up to, and it's a, a lot going on across a big region of 12 counties and 11 Finger Lakes in the southern tier. So I'm really just going to scratch the surface. I'll, I'll leave time uh, to answer qu questions you may have, whether it's about a, a land or water protection project or a management issue. So just pop those into the chat and we'll, we'll get to them over the course of uh, the program. But bear with me a sec, I'm gonna um, share screen here. All right. Um, well, I hope you're all seeing the shore of Cayuga Lake. Kelly, are they, you seeing the shore of Cayuga Lake? I am. We've had, we've had our twists and turns. <laughs> I don't take anything for granted anymore. Um, by the way, like uh, new cars are not always as good as uh, old cars, new laptops I've learned are not always as good as old laptops. But in any event, the good news, the great news is if you've heard in the media, uh, this property bell station that we've pursued for about a decade, uh, located on the east side of Cayuga Lake, it's the largest remaining privately owned shoreline, undeveloped shoreline parcel in all the Finger Lakes. It was uh, once slated to host a nuclear plant that fortunately didn't happen. And then for the last 50 years, it's been sitting there in the possession of New York State Electric and Gas. Uh, about 10 years ago, we worked with the state to include it by name in the uh, state's open space plan as a priority for protection. But about Labor Day, uh, we learned it was headed for an online uh, virtual auction to the highest bidder in a very hot real estate market. And while we were prepared to pay fair market value, we or government are constrained by an appraisal and others in the auction wouldn't be. So I wanna thank everyone who is out there who helped stop this auction where we uh, did a bit of a Hail Mary as did other local groups and local elected officials to urge our brand new governor at the time, uh, Kathy Hochul, to intervene and influence NYSEG uh, to stop the auction, which they did. And subsequently, we uh, secured a, a purchase contract recently with NYSEG, and we will be buying uh, the property probably in about May. Um, the property itself is, is quite beautiful. It has, again, 3,400 feet of shoreline, including a point. It is easily accessible because the former rail line is kind of a naturalized hiking path for all 3,400 feet of shoreline. Also features mature woods and a number of really pretty waterfalls like the one featured here. Now, a portion of it is also leased agricultural fields. This shows the property. It's just north of the Millican Station power plant, and it runs about a mile and a quarter back from the lake. And one of the twists on this um, project that is a, a, something we've never done is that the town of Lansing was very interested in seeing a portion of the property utilized for solar energy development, which was also a, as a statewide priority. So once we acquired the property, we will subdivide it into two parcels and the unshaded portion on the lake side, which includes kind of the first row of fields, will become a state wildlife management area by prior agreement with the state. And on the right side, the shaded area, we will explore the possibilities of utilizing that for solar energy uh, and then convey the property to uh, the developer of that at some point. But that is not entirely clear and that is uh, going to be something that is evolving as we proceed. Now it was it was a big year for Lansing because another project we've been working on for more than a decade just south of Bell Station and just north of Myers Point is a beautiful property uh, about 240 acres that was owned for many years 40 years by the Sims family and this property features 4,300 feet of woodlands and bluff bordering Cayuga Lake. It also has some beautiful uh, meadows, about 60, 70 acres of fields. And um, I know it because at Teganic Falls State Park, if you ever have a picnic on the peninsula, it's about 80 to 90% of the view across the lake. 
So you're looking at this property, which we call Cayuga Cliffs. And uh, this is the view from the Taganic side of the lake. We purchased uh, at a generous uh, bargain sale, we purchased 200 acres, including all the shoreline, that'll be a new preserve. And they also donated a conservation easement on their remaining acreage and they continue to live there. Uh, this is something we'll be developing a site management plan and given the Bell Station emerging this year, probably we will open this to the public. Uh, it might take us two years to put in the parking area and trails and so on. But this will be a new preserve that's retained by the land trust. In contrast to Bell Station, this is Cayuga Cliffs. So think view of the lake, Bell Station, railroad grade at lake level, easy to access the lake. Uh, from a stewardship standpoint, this also means that uh, managing the site in a way will be easier because the public use and the activity of use will be lower here than at Bell Station, where uh, one of the things that we considered in looking at that project, aside from the resources needed to buy the property or is how to manage it, and we expect at Bell Station a high enough use by the public that it's really good that the owner of that has someone with police powers, like a conservation officer, to uh, ensure safety and it's used well. Uh, sticking in the Ithaca area, we did a lot of work this year on the city's drinking water supply, Six Mile Creek. Uh, we completed three conservation easements that protected more than a mile of stream bank, 300 acres. And this is a portion of a uh, easement we purchased on the Lounsbury farm, which in addition to having a beautiful forested stream corridor that is really the backdrop for the hamlet of Brooktondale, it also is a, a charming uh, uh, pastoral farm with a, with a very uh, charismatic herd of sheep. And uh, if you're ever passing through this area, just uh, in your navigation, look for Lounsbury Road and you can drive right through the middle of it. And it's just about, uh, uh, you know, literally hundreds of yards from the hamlet of Brookdendale on the east side of Ithaca. Over on the west side in the, the watershed of Taganic Creek, we completed a wonderful easement on more than 200 acres that was donated by Jim Miner, who's very active in the New York Forest Owners Association. And this is actually in the Cayuga watershed but located in Schuyler County in the town of Hector. Uh, just recently, we closed on a conservation easement in the Emerald Necklace Greenbelt that uh, is immediately adjacent to Hammond Hill State Forest. And this, we are really thrilled to get because this property of about 60 plus acres includes some beautiful forest, but also a significant frontage on Owego Creek which is the region's premier stream uh, for brook trout, for native brook trout. And uh, the owners actually, before donating the easements, have already worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service to both restore streamside habitat through plantings and enhance fish passage by removing a culvert that was, uh, had eroded to the point where it was blocking the fish from going upstream. Uh, more easements completed this year. Uh, after years of effort, a really neat project over in Cortland County near the Greek Peak Ski Resort. Three adjoining neighbors who owned collectively 250 acres that bordered State Forest and the Finger Lakes Trail in concert all donated easements. And you can see how it fits in um, to this view where the Finger Lakes Trail and uh, it's the white dash line that passes right by these properties. And the Greek Peak Ski Resort is in the upper right. And you can see from this picture where these privately owned lands that are kind of the midst of public lands play a key role for the, the future, both from an ecological value and for recreation. Greek Peak is an area that and on one hand it's rural, but we see a considerable amount of subdivision going on because of its, uh, some of the amenities there and the ability to commute to Ithaca and Portland, I think some even up to Syracuse. Uh, we also are completing um, some acquisitions in, in this area as well. Uh, it's kind of trying to connect these existing conservation lands. We uh, acquired this site, which is literally on the Finger Lakes Trail in the town of Ithaca. Uh, for those of you who know Ithaca, this is the trail in from Route 13 towards Lake Brook and the bridge over the uh, Cayuga Inlet. And we um, 
dug deep in our pockets for this one. We're still digging, we're still raising money. Uh, but this was a, a fairly expensive property because this seven acre former cornfield uh, was, I, to my knowledge, the only property on a state highway that's undeveloped and zoned industrial in the town of Ithaca. And this is a very popular trailhead. What you can't see in this picture is there's a gravel parking lot that on a typical weekend have about 14 cars. And um, in addition to being buffer for both the Cayuga Inlet and Enfield Creek, this is a, a very popular access point. And this map shows the context, the, the seven acre acquisition, which, which was um, $130,000 because of its uh, industrial commercial value. Uh, but you can see how it fits into uh, connecting Robert Treeman State Park to our Tap and Mitra Preserve. And over the years, State Parks has acquired land to the north, which is the future route of the Black Diamond Rail Trail that now runs from Taganic to Ithaca. But they're planning to extend it from Ithaca to Robert Treeman Park. The um, kind of orangey park parcel you see is owned by the Cornell Botanic Gardens, the natural area. And then our Swedler Preserve is to the north. So uh, this is a great opportunity to really ensure puffer, public access, buffer this area, and build upon these earlier projects. Uh, shifting over to Owasco Lake, we completed a conservation easement on nearly 100 acres that includes uh, frontage on the Owasco Inlet, the biggest tributary of the lake, which you see here, as well as a tributary in forests and fields. On the east side of Skinny Atlas, one of our focus areas, you can see highlighted here uh, a new trail we developed because last year we acquired 75 more acres to connect our existing preserves. So we now own two and a quarter miles of woodland running north-south here. This is an area that is quite important to the health of the lake. It's an Audubon designated important bird area. It's a state open space priority project. So this is a uh, has a lot of recognitions for its significance, and uh, we will be telling you about more projects here in the future. Uh, here's a, a shot of our, our staff out for a work day uh, developing the trail, um, and this is now open. And our next goal is with one or two landowner agreements to connect downhill to the lake. Um, long term, we also want to. Uh, connected to the Bear Swamp trail system, which already probably has 15 to 20 miles of trail there, and ultimately have a arc of conserved lands extending around the southern half of the lake and including trails connecting it off. Um, just a bit to the north near the Staghorn Cliffs, where we've acquired about 150 acres, we partnered with the US Fish and Wildlife Service to uh, restore uh, vernal pools and wetlands in an agricultural field that came with a property we acquired because it included about a thousand feet of shoreline and some really nice mature forest. And what's really wonderful about these projects is you can see this was a graded flat um, uh, hay field. And essentially all of our landscapes, even if they've reforested, they're much less diverse than they were before settlement because of this farming history. Because of course, you don't want to farm over hummocks and wet areas and so on. So over the generations of farming, we smoothed everything out. And for particularly invertebrates and insects, the birds that eat them, this really uh, is not great for them. And also for water quality, it means that water, even if it's forested, water runs off quicker into the lake, which is one of the problems as we have uh, this excessive nutrient enrichment. This is an aerial view and that same field is on the right side of the photo. And you can see uh, these vernal pools earlier this year. And I think one of them is not vernal. I think one's a year round pond, but this is done where they've uh, uh, created four different areas. Um, I can tell you from making several visits there from when it was bare dirt and uh, dry to um, you know, when it was quite wet with our heavy rains this summer, uh, seeing spotted sandpipers, waterfowl, uh, lots of insects and frogs, and it really has, has added a lot to the site. And at the same time, what it does with these storm events is holds back that water so it seeps into the groundwater rather than just shooting down the gorges and carrying the nutrients into the lake. 
Uh, so we'll be doing more of this around the region. Uh, just down the road from that, uh, on route, State Route 41, this is just south of Skinny Atlas Lake, a view of the Birdsall Farm, where we partnered with the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets to purchase a conservation easement here. This is about our fourth farm in this area that we've done that. And this was just one of two. This is at the top of Ripley Hill, looking at Skinny Atlas Lake, where we also worked with the Franklin family to uh, purchase a conservation easement on their 500 acre farm. And this easement does protect farmland, but in their case, it also provides for a vegetated buffer that is not farmed on Grout Brook, which is one of the key tributaries to Skinny Atlas Lake. And this map shows you uh, where this is on, on the right, that kind of beige color, that's portions of the farm, the 500 acres we secured. And just uh, several weeks ago, the purple parcel is an addition that we just actually, land we bought outright as part of creating this green belt around the southern end of the lake. This is 27 acres that is a mix of woods and field, all quite steep. So it uh, is, enhances protection of the watershed, but also creates a, a larger corridor of conservation land to provide more habitat value. And panning back a bit, this shows you just the incredible amount of activity we've, been, we've had in Skinny Atlas just in the last few years um, at this focus area of the South End. And the yellow or orange are either conservation easements that exist or conservation easements that are in process for which we have state funding to complete. Uh, you can see our preserves are in dark green. So to the north where it says Cora Comp Dickinson, that's where those vernal pools were. And then the trail system we've been extending on the Hinchcliffe and High Vista preserves. And then over on the left side, you can see we've also been adding land to Bear Swamp State Forest and having some success uh, just off the lake in acquiring some of the steep hillsides off what's known as the Glenhaven Road. And we're now working on another parcel there. So this is uh, uh, heartening because for any of you who've been, spent any time in Skinny Atlas, like other parts of the region, the real estate market is white hot and looking south at places that people didn't used to think of buying or now it's kind of the, uh, the market focus is shifting uh, south. So we have a window of time to do all this work. Um, and now I'm leaving the Finger Lakes to go to the Southern Tier. Uh, about 40% of our service area actually uh, is in the watershed of the upper Susquehanna River. So all the hill country to the south uh, drains south to the Chesapeake Bay. And one of the key rivers is the Chemung, where we have a focus area between Elmira and Corning. And if you've never paddled it, I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful stretch of river. And uh, there are several outfitters now that will drop you off and pick you up. This is a view from a property. We just completed the protection of about 1,000 feet of riverfront in partnership with the town of Big Flats. And this was a case where Big Flats, the town now owns it as a conservation area, and we hold a conservation easement so they can have some improvements for a canoe put in and uh, uh, some recreational use, but a future town administration can't change its mind and put the highway barn there or something. We also partnered with the town of Big Flats at our largest preserve, Steggy Hill, which is very close to the river. Um, this is a 600 acre preserve with several miles of hiking trail. And it, at Steggy Hill, we did a couple things this past year with a grant from the New York State Conservation Partnership Program and some in-kind contributions from the town of Big Flats and, and some other partners. But we had a parking area, it's quite a popular preserve and particularly in winter, some people ski there. And we had a parking area that was essentially a converted log landing from before we owned it. And it was on the sketchy side and the, the road didn't have any shoulder either. So we really needed to uh, accommodate the level of use and mitigate a, a safety issue. So we had the sexy project of building a new parking lot, but it's actually a very nice parking lot. And while we were at it though, we did a professionally designed interpretation. And for anyone who hiked the old trail at Steggy Hill, which essentially was straight up the grade for 
I don't know, Betsy will correct me, but I think it's probably like 900 feet of elevation straight up the grade. You now have a third less grade and you have it at a switchback slope. So it's a much more user-friendly trail. Uh, still down in the Shemung, uh, all this nearby, this is our Kehoe Preserve, which is across the river from the thousand feet I just mentioned us acquiring with the town of Big Flats. We're really building complex of conservation land, uh, a nice riverfront preserve, that had a field of several acres that was entirely covered with non-native invasive brush. Uh, we partnered with the Upper Susquehanna Coalition to clear the brush and plant about 600 native trees and shrubs. So uh, this is uh, one of the crew members. Uh, this is year one. I figure with these planting projects, we really have to look at a decade of keeping the trees from being eaten by the deer and beating back the invasive brush that grows a lot quicker than the native stuff. But this is um, uh, really high quality habitat, particularly for migratory birds that come up that river valley. Now coming up, uh, we're actually uh, shifting over from the Shemung to the Susquehanna. This is the Susquehanna River uh, near the village of Owego. That's Route 17 or Interstate 86 on the right side. And we will soon be the owners of two islands that have one name, Tufts Island Singular. Maybe it was probably one island to it split in some flood, but it's actually two islands of about 40 acres. That This is a true preservation project where our intention is to acquire this island. If I'm remembering correctly, it's a bargain, I think $17,000 or something thereabouts. And uh, it is a Great habitat for bald eagles, waterfowl, a lot of mergansers, and a rare endangered mussel. The yellow heel splitter mussel is found here. And our intent for doing this is simply to avoid the one in 10 adult males with time and power tools and dumb ideas who might do some things on the island that make no sense and you really shouldn't do. Essentially, it's an insurance policy where we will monitor this and let this island keep being an island and available for wildlife habitat. Uh, now I'm going to jump to the West. Uh, as you can see, even despite the pandemic and all that's going on, we've had a very productive year. Uh, it's amazing how much has happened. Uh, this is another ribbon cutting, our Canandaigua Vista Preserve, where uh, we established a 100-acre uh, preserve, very scenic, diverse habitats. Uh, it's at the head of a, what's called Barnes Gully that feeds um, Canandaigua Lake. And it's also in an area, these, these communities such as Canandaigua, Geneva, Auburn, because they're, they're located in farm country and they're also pretty good sized communities they are growing, have suburban development. There aren't lots of places to go to get outdoors. So there's a, a real uh, demand for securing, conserving these lands, but also in some areas, making them accessible. And this is some of what you see if you go visit some beautiful views of the lake Actually, there are some views that are beyond the lake, 30 miles over to past beyond Geneva. And this is also part of a, a, what we hope will be a growing network of land. We were very pleased that um, the town of Canandaigua contributed $100,000 toward this project. So uh, very excited about continuing expanding this partnership in, in the face of what's probably one of the strongest real estate markets. Competition for land here is very challenging. But while we still have time to secure not just the 100 acres, but a network of hundreds of acres that can accommodate uh, opportunities for people to get outdoors, but still have enough undisturbed habitat for animals as well. Now, just across from that area on the east side of the lake, we completed our ninth acquisition at Bear Hill, uh, the iconic landmark you see here. And this is one where the ownership on Bear Hill is, is fragmented into a lot of different parcels. And we proceed at the pace of the landowners as opportunities emerge. This time it was the, the purple piece, which is about 28 acres. And we um, you know, keep courting the other neighbors and a simple goal here of uh, keeping development down the slopes, both for a uh, for lake health, as well as the scenic character and the, the cultural significance of the site, which is of special significance to the Seneca Nation. Another site of significance to the Seneca Nation is Clark's Gully, 
which is located just several miles south of Bear Hill. And this uh, uh, fits into the origin story, story of the Seneca Nation, where uh, some accounts the nation emerged from this, this striking gorge on the south side of what's known as South Hill. And much of it is already conserved, but the, the land that encompasses the actual mouth of the gully uh, became available and we now own the land and uh, it's immediately adjacent to our West River Preserve. And for the future though, we're exploring both with the Seneca Nation and the, in New York State, which owns the surrounding state land, who, what is the best approach to managing this site? And that's an ongoing conversation and uh, we'll let you know where we turn up. It, even though it was private property for many years, it's always been publicly accessible. It continues to be publicly accessible and we're just trying to figure out the best way uh, to take care of it over the long run. And for orientation, you're looking at the south end of Seneca Lake and kind of in the, uh, just off the wetlands, there's kind of to the uh, center right, there's a beige area, which is, uh, which is our West River Preserve, which is a 65 acre grassland. And you can't see here, but Clark's Gully would be right across the road from that. Uh, Bear Hill is in the very distance in the far left of this photo. And this, this large land mass of South Hill in the center there is a real focus of our efforts right now because it is one of the largest wild areas that's immediately adjacent to a Finger Lake. In fact, uh, just two weeks ago, we completed an easement on 60 acres of woodlands up there. And again, or as with Bear Hill, uh, each year cultivating and talking to different owners and partners there and trying to steer development to other more appropriate areas. Now I'm gonna um, shift gears a bit and talk about um, as we've made these, these uh, all these successes have been accomplished in the past year on the, the land conservation front, I do wanna recognize how far we still have to go uh, on the water quality front. And this, uh, many of the images you've seen tonight are taken by our great volunteer photographer, Bill Hecht. And he took this one uh, just within the past month or so, I think. This is Yager Creek up at the north end of Cayuga Lake after a rainstorm. And there are many creeks in our, unfortunately, in the Finger Lakes where this is what they look like after a rainstorm. So uh, the, in terms of uh, toxic algae or harmful algal blooms, uh, they remain a concern. Uh, there, I've, I've talked before about the factors that include uh, climate change, both in terms of warming and it, in more intense storm events, land use and nutrient loading. And then what uh, really seems to be one of the more vexing and key issues, the science seems to be emerging that the muscles, the invasive quagga muscles, alter nutrient cycling and, and play a key role. But for our part of it, we're focused on the nutrient and sediment runoff. And we are taking steps to do what we can. This uh, is a highly eroded stream on our Van Riper conservation area. This is a preserve we have on the west side of Cayuga Lake, about two thirds of the way up. It's a beautiful preserve with, a, with about 2000 feet of shoreline. And it has this small stream, which is quite small, but it has the history that many streams in the Finger Lakes do. It's downslope from State Route 89. And if you think of most of our state highways that run north south along the lakes, they essentially in many areas create a dam for surface runoff. And then they funnel all the flow to a culvert that then shoots at a storm of high velocity water into a poor little stream like this that then proceeded to have huge erosion issues. And that's exactly what happened here, probably dating back to the 1970s or 60s. But uh, you see tremendous erosion in each storm, it washes all this nutrient rich sediment into the lake. So both for stabilizing, enhancing and stabilizing habitat and reducing runoff, we're gonna be partnering with uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the so Seneca County Soil and Water District to use natural materials such as uh, logs from on site, root wads from trees and some stone to put a more natural uh, and a stable uh, riffle and pool uh, system back. And one of the reasons this is a priority for us is again, this is not an uncommon um, issue in the Finger Lakes. And what we really wanna show is 
what we think is fish and wildlife's more sensitive and natural approach than what uh, a lot of highly engineered approaches have been done in the past where you would simply line this with riprap rock, which uh, really does not provide the habitat value. And in the long run, we have questions of, uh, you know, it's the right approach. On the wetland front, we are also partnering again with Fish and Wildlife, if all goes well starting next week, to restore wetlands in this area of the Owasco Flats. The Owasco Flats is about an 800 acre area at the south end of Owasco Lake that has some wonderful wetlands. And it also has some farmland that used to be wetlands that is becoming wetland again gradually. Uh, these, as the area is getting wetter, drainage ditches aren't always maintained, and we have some now opportunities to convert back some of this farmland to wetland. That's exactly what we're doing. Uh, the Land Trust last year uh, bought a parcel that we will convey to New York State as part of a new Owasco Flats Wildlife Management Area. But before we do so, uh, through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, we have hired a contractor who's going to be creating several acres of wetland uh, within the next week or two. Um, so they're excavating um, basins and plugging drainage ditches that were put in there by the previous farmer. In this area, there are really two levels of restoration. Right now, we're doing small scale, but ideally what we'd like to do is when we assemble more land and wouldn't flood neighbors that don't wanna be flooded, to do larger scale restoration to address what happened in the 1950s, where the, the Owasco Inlet, the stream that runs through here, has had flooding issues in the past, or particularly the village of Moravia had the flooding issues. So the Army Corps came in and deepened the inlet so it's disconnected from the floodplain. If you ever, this is a good place to go canoeing or kayaking. And if you're ever in there, you'll see these banks. And historically in spring, this used to slop over and drop its nutrients in the, the floodplain side. But because of the historic re-engineering, it's now largely disconnected. So that filtration function has been impaired. Uh, so we hope to do that in the future, but it'll take a while till we acquire more land. Now, as we work on the water issue, we're also looking um, at managing our upland uh, habitats that we own as best we can. And the issues there are we have too many deer. So we are investing a lot in uh, deer management programs to try and maintain the population uh, at a reasonable level, recognizing you really almost can't do that on a property by property basis. So we're getting involved in discussions with the state on that. We see region wide uh, a, a real impairment of forest regeneration in, in a lot of a lot of areas. And then the other issue is invasive uh, shrubs and, and trees in particular that are out competing our natives. But one success story to point success story to point to is our Lindsay Parsons Preserve in West Danby where our volunteer and our neighbor, John Smith, has been taking beautiful meadows. If you've never been there, I really recommend a visit that this rolling topography, it was overgrown, getting overgrown with honeysuckle uh, and multiflora rose. And we lost uh, one of the, the breeding birds that we'd like to have there, the bobolink, that uh, had not nested for, for a number of years. And we reaffirmed that thanks to John's efforts and others, the grasslands are back, the bobolinks are back, and uh, now we're right now in the long-term planning of how at the sites where we have grasslands, what is gonna be our long-term strategy to ensure appropriate management. One of our issues, region one, I can tell you is the, the guys with tractors who typically you would ask to, to mow these fields, the average age of the farmer doing that now is about 78 and the average age of the tractor is about 56. So we're looking at how are we gonna, 10, 20 years from now, we're, how are we gonna mow all these fields? And before opening up for question, I do wanna mention too, even despite the, the challenge of the pandemic of engaging new people and getting people together, we had some success, and I will mention this photo I think was taken that brief sunny moment in July before we knew about the Delta variant and people were out and everything. Uh, but we, we have been reaching out to get uh, you know, more people and different people on the land. This is just one small example uh, where uh, our, our preserve manager, Jason Gorman, took out and provided a tour to an English as a second language class. 
And we're also looking at some underserved communities like in Elmira and Geneva and Auburn of how we can translate our work to the folks that may not be getting to the preserves now. So very much a work in progress, but something as we do all these other uh, you know, land and water-based projects recognizing uh, we have to remain focused on serving the entire community of the Finger Lakes. And we couldn't do it without you. So that is just an overview, but I, I really wanna open it up for uh, whatever questions you have on any of this stuff. Thanks, Andy. Um, Donna Scott had a question right away when you were talking about grassland restoration, and she wondered if the lab of ornithology um, offers any help with that. Not in the management side. We do consult with the lab, and particularly John Fitzpatrick serves on our president's council. So I actually um, just saw him the other day. So on the expertise and guidance side, uh, we, we frequently turn to the lab and other local academic institutions. But the real tricky part is with the conservation success we've had, we have a lot of field or what we call early successional habitat and it's all over the place. So it's, it's uh, um, Tioga County, Yates County, Cayuga County, Onondaga County, Tonka. So, so there's a, a spatial issue aside from uh, the fact of uh, who's going to mow it all and who's tractor and, and, and paying for all that. So um, that's where one of the processes, the, the land trust has conserved 28,000 acres. We held about 160 conservation easements and um, the preserves are thousands and thousands of acres. So one of the exercises we're doing right now is projecting out in 10 or 20 years, we think we're going to protect more land, but also what do we foresee? What are we shooting for in terms of stewardship, in terms of maintaining infrastructure, managing people, mowing fields, and how does that translate into staffing and endowment? So that's what's kind of bring this to the fore is one, conservation success. We've added a lot in the last few years, but then also uh, thinking ahead before it is a problem. Another question that just popped up, um, and this one is about the solar farm uh, idea about being that part being added to the Bell Station project. Um, this question is, what are the economic impacts of the solar farm and will there, the energy, what will the energy go towards? Um, a couple of things. Well, one, I can tell you where it won't go for is we uh, don't have a formal board vote yet, but every board member I've talked to and every staff member agrees that whatever we do with solar cannot be used in any way to justify a Bitcoin mine. So we're gonna be very careful and make sure that whatever solar that we had anything to do with goes into the grid or goes towards uses that for the collective good and not Bitcoin mining. Um, in terms of the economic impact, I really can't speak to that. I can tell you though that for the town of Lansing, they're, they're very interested in it because the, the shoreline will be tax exempt. Uh, the, the state wildlife management areas do not make payment in lieu of taxes. And that was a significant concern of the town that was mitigated by the fact that the solar portion would generate tax revenue. Um, and this goes back about a decade so that we've been working, you know, negotiating with the town on this for quite some time. And uh, that was really a big issue for them. And it is for a, a number of communities as they consider larger scale conservation projects. Great. Anybody else has questions and just put them right into the chat. Those are the only two that popped up initially. You must have done such a good job answering everybody's questions already. <laughs> See a thumbs up from Jean Benson. <laughs> Either that or people are zoomed out and after that, <laughs> after a good presentation, they don't, they don't have anything else to say. We do have a comment though, this is nice. Um, just a comment that the work at Steggy Hill has been much appreciated in the area is highly used on a regular basis. 
Yeah, and feel free, you know, Kelly, to we, if you have questions about getting out to see these areas, first, I want to put in a plug for our gofingerlakes.org website, which is a different website than the Land Trust website, and it's purely geared towards the best places for outdoor recreation, regardless who owns them. But also feel free to call us up if, if you are kind of thinking of traveling outside your local area and visiting any of these sites, because uh, you know, we're happy to share our experiences and preferences, whether, whether or not you end up agreeing with them or not, but we're always happy to share our opinion. Ooh, I, have a, I have a good one. How does the Finger Lakes Land Trust get their resources for land purchases? Oh, very good question. I, you know, as I kind of uh, glossed past that on the multi-million dollar Bell Station purchase. <laughs> so, so what happens when you don't have a script in front of you, you tend to miss a few things, just a key detail. Uh, the, we are very fortunate that um, over the years, we've grown a internal revolving fund we call our Opportunity Fund. So uh, for those of you who follow us closely, you know that we, we buy a lot of land for the state because New York State has been generous for conservation, but it's slower than molasses. So last year, for example, at Connecticut Hill, uh, a family that had land for 100 years really wanted to see this in state ownership state wanted to buy, the state absolutely could not tell this family when they might ever close. So with this revolving fund, we were able to buy the land. We now own it. Hopefully next year we'll sell it and roll that money over again. And that's important because if we didn't have that, there are very capable conservationists in the Adirondacks and the Hudson Valley and other parts of the state who are quite good at doing the same thing. So all the money would go there. But in the case of Bell Station, we are using uh, some of them are revolving loan funds, but there just isn't enough money. So um, we're doing, we're fortunate the Park Foundation has given us a generous two-year loan at 0.5%, but we're also momentarily launching a campaign to raise 500,000 that we still need to acquire the land. Now, if all goes well, we will get that money back at the end of the process, maybe a couple of years from now, once we sell the land to the state and the solar, and for any contributions, any kind of money left over will go back in the opportunity fund. So it will be rolled over with other future acquisitions. Um, so in, in general, for these cooperative acquisitions, we rely on the opportunity fund. For preserves, we're going to buy outright. We try to raise as much before we own it. So it, it varies whether it's individuals primarily, but sometimes a state grant, sometimes foundations. Uh, but um, to, the, to the maximum extent with preserves, we try to raise it before we own it and then move on to the next one. Great. Um, there's another question here about water quality and our conservation efforts. How, how did those conservation efforts along the um, lands along inlets how did those help protect water quality? And will that will those conservation efforts help prevent algal, harmful algal blooms? Um, well, there are two different, the, there's two different uh, activities we're doing. One is kind of along the lines of preservation. And I would say it doesn't make it better. It keeps it from getting worse because it ensures that somebody won't, you know, bulldoze the buffer of the creek and create a problem. But to make it better, that's where these, uh, these vernal pools, wetlands, um, some cases stormwater detention basins that are that are more engineered, and also creation of buffers. Buffers in our agricultural landscape are very important because in many areas, uh, to maximize production, the buffers have been squeezed to almost nothing. So we're trying to put those back to slow down runoff, detain runoff, and those will actually improve it. Uh, but while much of our land work, it's keeping it from getting worse, I think. And one of the things you talked about during your presentation, Andy, were conservation corridors and kind of building conservation corridors. And there's a question about um, whether there is a plan to connect the actual finger lakes with preserves to allow um, the flow of wildlife. Um, there's, there's actually, I'm not sure if you could find it online, but one of the corridors we're most focused on has been designated by, they're, they're slightly different models, but um, the, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the Nature Conservancy 
and another group, the Wildlands Project, have looked at corridors, uh, both for plants and animals, across a continental scale. And if you think of um, the Catskills, the Adirondacks, and then you think of uh, Central PA, which has some really wild areas in the Appalachians and Potter County, and then you, the, our hill country at the places like Connecticut Hill or High Tor or to the east, the State Forest in Cortland County. If you go on Google Earth, you can see this kind of archipelago of wild land that's still separated by farms, but, but has grown back to a good bit of forest. That has been identified as, as one of these corridors on a kind of our local version of a continental scale corridor. So that's where, and it's vast, it's very large. It includes the Emerald Necklace Project in Ithaca, uh, and also some areas we're working in the Western Finger Lakes. But because of its scale, we, and, and, and the value for like a large number of species, we've really focused on that. It's just a mammoth project. So we focus less on from the lakes to different preserves, Though along waterways, there are opportunities for narrower quarters that may not uh, serve some of the larger mammals, but still have values for a lot of wildlife. But, it, but in general, with it, the, the, the additional research we have, we're really looking at that large scale, uh, you know, our piece of the continental scale system. And you'll hear more about that as we're, we're just kind of finalizing some of the details of, of what, uh, what portions we're going to pursue. Um, there's another question here about fundraising that actually I can just answer. And that's does the FLT use a fundraising company to have fundraising events? And no, we don't use a company um, and we don't actually do fundraising events. We do have events, um, you know, to talk about our projects and to connect with people in the region and to thank our donors, but we don't um, hold events specifically to fundraise. Um, and then we, it's, you know, we do kind of rely on the traditional mail, our members um, and email and um, those kind of things to do our, our individual fundraising. Um, and a follow up to that was a why not. Um, actually, I'm so glad that we don't rely on big events right now <laughs> to do our fundraising. I know that there's a lot of nonprofits that are hurting because they do do like they have a big gala and that's where they raise most of their money. Um, and of course, right now, Nobody has gala. I mean, you can't really have a Zoom galas aren't. This is our Zoom gala. Um, it's not. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. We just rely on that kind of more traditional letters and uh, mailings and things like that. One thing, one thing I think factors in is geography. Mm -hmm. if, yeah. If, if we were the Ithaca organization, we just did Ithaca. I think to me personally, it'd be more appealed to do a big event. But when you think of night and alcohol and an event like that, and you think, oh, we have people in Rochester and Corning and Syracuse, Skinny Atlas. It's you either, to be equitable, end up doing six or eight events, or you have this compromise where it's really convenient to no one. So that, that also makes it easier for us to kind of think that way. Yeah, absolutely. That is the last question in the chat. I don't know if anybody has any last questions or thoughts they want to share. Well, thanks, everybody. And just to let you know, uh, this spring, we'll be getting back to having a lot more field trips and getting out, uh, getting folks out in the field. So hope to see you out on the trails and anytime you have questions, don't hesitate uh, to contact either of us or any of the staff. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for your interest, everybody. Um, oh, somebody just asked about this live recording. So I will um, probably some point next week, I'll put it up on our website. And um, if I, you know, when I do that, I'll try actually to email everybody who registered. Um, so you'll be able to access it that way. So thanks. Thanks again. Bye, everybody.